is just to stop in the middle of Walmart and pray for somebody. We need to be looking for every opportunity. One of the first things we started talking about was faith. And I'm not going to spend near as much time on it this week as last week. But faith is imperative because it is vital to every aspect of our Christian walk. From the very beginning, faith is involved. Because we have to, by faith, accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. By faith, we had to believe that we confess our sins, that He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And faith is not always a feeling. Sometimes it's just simply believing. It's just knowing. You know that you know that you know. And we would talk about, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but who, what do we say is the enemy of faith? What, Mom? Doubt. Doubt. Doubt is the enemy of faith. We cannot have faith if we doubt. If we look at Jesus and his temptation in the wilderness, he comes out, and what does he find the disciples trying to do? We like to use this, um, so, well, I should say we like to use this, but we can use this as an excuse when it comes to casting out demons, but he finds the disciples trying to cast out demons. And so many times people skip over this little part and they go to the well, the reason that they weren't able to cast it out was because this kind doesn't come out by a prayer fast. And most times they don't focus on this little part, but Jesus didn't come out right away and say, Peter, the reason you were able to cast out that demon is because you haven't been praying and you haven't been fasting. What's the very first thing that he told the disciples why the, why the demon would come out. You doubt it. He didn't say that you weren't praying and fasting. He said, you, didn't, you doubt it. If we look at Peter, they're coming back on the Sea of Galilee from the land of the Gadarenes. Great storms in there. And they see something like a ghost walking on the water. And Peter gets out of the boat. And what does he do? He walks on the water. And he gets so far, and he begins to sink. Why does he begin to sink? He started doubting. That's exactly what I was looking for, brother. It's not that he didn't have faith, because he had faith. He was walking on the water. But when he doubted, he began to sink. And we go to the book of James. We love to use that verse for the person riding the fence. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't ride the fence. Get off the fence and get saved now. He laughed. I'm sure you've heard that preach throughout your years, brother. But if we take the verse in context, it's not a matter of riding the fence. It's dealing with faith and prayer. The hand, two go hand in hand. And the Bible, if you're double-minded, then what are you doing? You're down. If we're going to see signs and wonders follow us, if we're going to have faith, true faith, exactly. And you can't go by feeling either when you go by faith. We go by what Jesus said. I remember Sister Gilman telling us in, um, I think, this personal evangelism class that she was witnessing to a woman and she was giving her heart to Christ. And she gave her heart to Christ, but she was still distraught because she didn't feel like her sins were taken away. And for about 10 minutes, she had, Sister Goodwin had to go back and forth, but what does the Bible say? If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive yours. And she said she went back and forth, back and forth, and it went on for a minute. I think she said probably about 10 minutes. What was the issue there? It wasn't a feeling issue, it was a matter of faith issue. Know that your sins were forgiven. Know that her sins were forgiven. Once we have faith, then we're going to move on to another aspect today. I'm sure we all have knives in our lives. How many of us like to cut with a dollar knife? I remember years ago, Dad came up and 
he was going to be nice and cut my poor woman that I had him pick up for me from Sam's. Mom's laughing because she already knows. And he was complaining and grumbling because my knife wasn't as sharp as it was supposed to be. I'm sure none of us like to use dollar knives. None of us like to cut up our meat with dollar knives. We're not going to go try to cut up a steak with a, pork, uh, with a butter knife if we have the option. We're going to go after the steak knife. We're going to go after something sharper. In our own life, I'm sure Brother Peterman, Brother Craig, uh, Dennis, when you go hunting, you don't want to go with a dull knife because when it comes time to cut open the deer, you don't want to be sawing there and hacking away. That's what the stones are for. That's what stones are for. Because you can sharpen it down. You need a sharp knife. You don't want to go hunting with a dull knife. No. But how many Christians live their spiritual, live their lives with the dull knife? What do I mean by that? As Christians, if we are going to be sharp in the things of God, if we're going to be sharp spiritually, once we have faith, we move on to prayer. You can have the Word of God in your life as much as you want, and I realize the Word of God is powerful in itself, but if we never take the Word of God and add it to prayer, we are never going to sharpen it to the point that we're going to be able to make it effective in our life. There was a gentleman that we went to Bible school with. And you know, he had a lot of head knowledge. A lot of head knowledge. He knew a lot about the Bible. Didn't need to have any books really near. He could pretty much take you to the verse, get you there close. He could go deep, but he never prayed. He went from believing that you needed the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and you need to be praying in tongues every day, so now he doesn't even believe in the baptism. Why? Because he never prayed about anything. He acquired a lot of head knowledge, but he never prayed about it. If we are going to become Pentecostal powerhouses, we are going to become strong on our feet when we are on our knees. We need to find ourselves in a place of prayer. It is that place of prayer that is going to make us the man or woman who is able to stand in the gap. It is going to make us that man or the woman that is pleasing to God. Is going to make us that man or woman who knows the secrets of God because we are constantly developing our relationship with Him. We are becoming that man or woman who is becoming more in the more in the steps of Enoch and Elijah, where we are allowing the Word of God and the Holy Ghost to mold our lives, to take off the draws to get rid of those things that God doesn't want us to do, and take up those things that He does want us to do. Whether it be reading the Bible more, whether it be praying more. Whether it be fasting or But a true man or woman of God cannot be moved by the things of this world, but rather they are the one who can move the things of this world. What do I mean by that? Let a man or woman who really knows the power of prayer will not be intimidated by those physical things that seem impossible. A man or woman of God who knows what it is to find a place of prayer, who knows God, is not going to be intimidated when other people come against him. Raven Hill said this, a man who is intimate with God is not intimidated by man. You realize that the closer you get with God, you will bring intimidation upon other people, maybe jealousy, they might bring strife against you, controversies, hardship, but a man or woman who is intimate with God has no reason to be intimidated by man. We are not him that can kill the flesh, but rather him that can kill the whole body, mind, and soul. I know I misquoted that verse, but you know the gist of where I'm coming from. If we know God, we have no need to fear man. Leonard Ravenhill also said this, No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is plain. The people who are not praying are strained. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers. Few prayers, many singers. Many clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. 
much fashion, little passion, many interferers, few intercessors, many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. Prayer is one of the greatest unutilized weapons that the church possesses in its arsenal. Leonard Ravenhill used to say this, if you really wanted to get to know, wanted to get to know a man, let me listen to him pray. Why? Because a man or woman who knows how to get a hold of God is a real asset in the hands of God. John Wesley was burdened to prayer more after reading the prayer life of David Brainerd in his journals. And when we look at Wesley, he was there involved in the beginning of the Great Awakening. Why? Because he was burdened. And I'm trying to think of a better word. I don't he realized that he was lacking in prayer. It became burned by the fact that he was not as prayerful as David Brainerd was. David Brainerd had said that he used to pray with a shower blanket wrapped around him. And he wasn't a tall man, but he used to pray until the snow came up to his chest. And then he'd shake it off and then move on. It is said that Charles Spurgeon at times would be carried onto the platform by, to preach by two men as they would pull him out of his prayer closet because it was time for him to preach. John Knox of England used to pray, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. Praying John Hyde of India, he's buried him from 40 miles north of where my brother lies in Quincy, Illinois. It is said that a young man about the age of 12 or 14 went to prayer with him one day. And he said that within the first 10 minutes of him praying, he was afraid to reach out his hand because he was afraid that he was going to touch something physical. He said it seemed like only an hour passed and a knock came on the door. John Hyde, it's time for you to come preach. It's two, it's about 10 minutes to three. He said, it seemed like we were only in there for an hour, but yet they went to prayer about 10 or 11 that morning. A man or a woman who knows how to pray, pray does not need to be intimidated by a man. But prayer is vital to the Christian life. If we look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6 and 6, and also verse 7, if someone will please read that. Matthew 6, 6, 6, 7, and you might as well read Matthew 6, 9 while you're there. Jesus is telling everyone that it's not a matter of if you pray, but you need to pray. 
You're expected for it. It is necessary. And we find something interesting, too, with the disciples here. If we read it in context, they wanted to know how to pray. Why did they want to know how to pray? Is it that the disciples haven't been praying their entire life? No. You go to the synagogue. You go to the temple. I'm sure they prayed there. They knew what prayer was. But when Jesus prayed, there was something different. Ever see somebody do something? Or it's like, man, I want to do it like that. Or man, teach me how to do that. I need to know how to do that. It becomes a desire and a burden. Why? Because it's something out of the ordinary. See, anybody can pray. But not anybody can pray. The disciples knew what it was to go to prayer. But when they heard Jesus pray, there is something different. In all honesty, not putting anybody down, but if you ever went to a Catholic church or a Methodist church or something like that, and you ever heard anybody pray, but then you get into a Pentecostal prayer meeting, there is a big old difference between praying and praying. And that's exactly what was going on here. The disciples knew what it was to pray, but they've never seen anybody pray like Jesus. So like, Lord, teach us to pray. So it's not a matter of if we pray, but it's a matter of when we pray. And we can pray, or we can pray. And there is a big difference between the two. And we want to know what it is to pray. And when we look at Jesus Christ here in the Sermon on the Mount, he spent some time focusing on prayer. And he gives examples. Why does Jesus give examples? Because not everyone can attain the spiritual. And Jesus showed us through examples because, as Brother Heath used to say, you can have all the Bible you want in your sermon, but throw a few illustrations in there. Why? Because illustrations are windows that open up your sermon to let people in so they know what you're talking about. To bring it down to the common level sometimes. Now, you don't want a house full of glass windows, but show some light in there. And that's exactly what Jesus said. Let's shine some light in there, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. So he gave us the example of the hypocrite. And he showed them what it was for the hypocrite to pray. And he was showing them, through the use of the hypocrite, that he's just a pretender. He likes to do things for show. And he uses him versus a sincere publican. And while the hypocrite knew all the right words to say, he knew how to pray, he knew what order to pray, he knew where to place these and where to place the thou's, and he knew when to use the word the as the and when to pronounce it as the. But then you had the penitent or sin, uh, sinner standing there with his head pat bow, saying, the Lord have mercy on me, beating his chest. He may not have the wording right. If he would have showed up in our churches, he might not have known when to lift his hands. He might not have known when to shout amen. He might have been that one off color in the back that after everybody just said amen, he's chiming up about five minutes later. Amen. He didn't have everything. He didn't have religion down to a T. But what he did have down was he knew that he was a sinner and he needed repentance. And when Jesus looked at that and looked upon their two prayers, he took the person who was sincere versus all the one who knew the power, knew a lot of right words to say. When it comes to prayer, we may not always have the right words. When it comes to prayer, we might not have the words at all. Look at Hannah when she was in the temple praying for her child. Eli thought she was drunk. If they would have thought that she was at a time of prayer, a deep prayer, they would have laughed at her and probably thrown her out of the temple for misconduct. You're just putting on a show. Get out of here. But that woman there was praying. And she was praying. And she didn't know what to pray, Brother Dennis. But she had a burden on her heart that God knew. And she found, her, uh, found herself in a place of prayer. In a place where she all she could do was groan. She couldn't utter any real words. Prayer is not always pretty. Prayer
Prayer can be painful. But for the person who knows what it is to pray, does not need to fear man or be intimidated because God is on our side. If we really get it out in the scripture and we start learning the, the do's and the don'ts and the pros and the cons of prayer, we can talk about the positions of prayer. We find throughout um, the Word of God that there's a standing position of prayer, of prayer that is a natural position. There's a kneeling position where you find yourself on a, your knees before God. And there's a prostrate position where you're flat on your feet, face before God, praying in prayer. When it comes to prayer, you realize that posture is not important. It really isn't. Posture may reflect our place of prayer. There's nothing wrong with praying as you're standing. There's nothing wrong with praying as you're kneeling. There's nothing wrong with laying flat on your face before God in prayer. Normally, I like to walk when I pray. There is no wrong position of prayer. It comes down to the heart condition. Where is your heart at when you pray? What did Jesus say about the hypocrite there? That when they pray aloud, they do for attention. You can have the most eloquent prayer and say a public prayer. Somebody can have you pray over a meal, pray over a couple, pray over somebody get healed. You can have the best prayer that they've ever heard. People can come up and pat you on the back. But if it didn't come from the heart, you've got your reward right there. But you can fumble around your words. I am not the most eloquent speaker. I really am not. My words run together. Sometimes I get half words mixed together. Sometimes my brain gets ahead of itself, and I don't get one word in front of the other word. God doesn't worry about your words in prayer. He's worried about the condition of your heart. And the prayer that doesn't get any attention as long as it comes from the heart, is a million times better than the prayer that is eloquent and comes from pride. Because the one that comes from the heart is the one that God pays attention to. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 13 state? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 13. Shutting out the world. 
when I was in Bible school, I thought I had a prayer closet. Every day, we had to go 